Okay, so this is just interesting. Again, all, all I really want to do today is deepen, and this is, again, not, not super simple, what I introduced yesterday, which is how to make a bar graph when your data is a bunch of numbers. And again, the key is a bunch of numbers, not just a few. Notice this is kind of a unique example, and, and, and I've sort of mentioned that you have a final project in this class. This was actually somebody's final project a couple of terms ago. Um, they actually collected the data of how many siblings there were in their marine platoon. So there were 50 people in their platoon and they surveyed them. Like I think it was via Facebook or something like that as to how many siblings they had. Notice this is kind of interesting because the, notice the raw answers that they got here are completely out of order. And of course you see zeros and ones and twos and threes. What's the biggest one you see? Yeah, notice in the upper left-hand corner up there, there's an eight and that was the biggest one. And so you actually, they only got answers zero to eight. So, so yesterday when we, when I said, okay, you know, let's break these boards and then let's see what different answers we get to our question. Hey, how much is this board going to break at? We break it. There were like 180 different answers. Well, there weren't 180 because there were some repeats in there, but there were a lot of different answers. Notice this time there's actually only, well, I guess eight different answers counting zero, zero is one of them. So zero to eight, there's actually nine different answers to this question. If that's the case, that there's only nine different answers. Notice this person really just had nine bar graphs. In other words, they didn't have to make classes for this. So if you ask a question and you can appreciate siblings might be something like that. Um, you know, what different answers actually are there? Well, they didn't actually need to group them together and create classes. Notice down here on the bottom, it's just zero, one, two, three. It's not like a range. It's not a, it's not a range from a, a lower class limit, we said, to an upper class limit. It's just one single number. And so, you know, that can happen. And again, that's the idea. It's just a question of, you know, what, what's the question you're asking and what, what kind of an answer might you get? But again, to highlight the purpose of this section, and this is all I really want to do, when you stare at that right there, if that's all you had was those 50 numbers all scattered randomly like that, doesn't that feel kind of hard to make any sense of? You have to stare pretty hard to see, oh yeah, look, I found an eight. And then at a glance, I see a bunch of zeros and I see a bunch of ones. But isn't it kind of cool to turn it into that? Doesn't that speak to you? Do you see why this is, why this is a thing? And of course, this is less work. Um, this is less work than the ones we did yesterday because all you have to do is just count them. You didn't have to do all this math to figure out what your class width is and all of that business because you, you, you can't, you only have eight, nine bars here. Notice interestingly, there were no sixes at all. But one of the things we're going to get into today before we're done, and I'll probably refer back to this a little bit later. But it's the concept of what shape do you see there? In other words, this kind of has, you know, that for a shape. There's like a crowd of answers, as you would expect, right? There's a crowd of answers over there at the zeros, ones, twos, and threes. And then it kind of starts to drop off after that. That's not really surprising that it ended up looking like that. Um, do you feel like this sample, not a population? but a sample of kind of all people, like what people do when they have kids. Do you feel like that might be representative of like the whole, let's just say the nation, or the, the nation, America, something like that? Do you think if we did, do you think if we did uh, not 50 people, but 50,000 people or something like that, maybe we got all the doctor's offices to tell us the answer to this question and we made another bar graph, do you think it would still be shaped like that? I kind of think it would too. Now. These, these numbers over here wouldn't be tens and eights. They'd be like 320 and stuff like that. But you see what I'm saying? It probably would take on the same shape because zero, one, and two are pretty common answers to that question. It's certainly going to taper off when you get way out there. My grandma, my grandmother had 16 siblings. And so you can probably appreciate there would be some, you know, this would actually kind of go further to the right and even get smaller. But you know, there's people that have more than eight. But 
that's it's it's interesting to think that this actually, although it's a sample, it's pretty significant. They did check with 50 people, not just 12. But if you check with 50 people, that might actually be representative. And that's the point of statistics. If we said, okay, this is the way, this is our best prediction of what America looks like, even though these numbers over here are going to get larger, it's still going to be kind of shaped like that. You know, that allows us to. That tells us something. Again, for me personally, that just feels like a curiosity. Like, who cares? Does anybody need to know that? Is that is that of interest to somebody? You know, a doctor or somebody that you know is, is money involved? Is that is that is that a way to market? Is there some reason, an actual reason, somebody would pay to kind of know this, as opposed to the rest of us just kind of being curious? I can't imagine something of that nature. But can you appreciate this one isn't that hard to build? I mean, I would I would just imagine, I'm not gonna do this completely, but I would imagine somebody looking up here and saying, okay, X, and I would like to highlight this, X here is the number of siblings. And the reason I say X is because X is commonly used in all math classes for a variable. In other words, it's something you just don't know what it is. How many siblings do you have? That's a variable. You're not gonna get the same answer from everybody. So I see there's a zero. So I find myself doing something like this. Okay, there's one, two, three. And you could do it slowly like this, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let's see, did I get it right? Yeah, look, I should say, did they get it right? Because all I did is copy this from what a student made, but notice they apparently counted that right. And of course, you don't have to make tick marks here because you could just count them. But but in this case, notice it'd be kind of easy to accidentally miss one or count it twice or something. That's why I kind of marked it out. Um, but again, it's kind of cool to use Excel. Like here, I don't have the choice. I would have to do this kind of manually like I just did. But if I was in Excel, I could actually put all these numbers in and I could actually ask it to put them in order and then it would be really easy for me to count them and I would make sort of make sure not to screw up. So in the end, I guess I kind of put this in the wrong spot, didn't I? Do you agree that this actually goes over here? Because the number I was counting was zero and then 10 goes over there and I won't continue, but you know, how many ones are there? Oh, there's 11. What goes here? What are you going to see here if you're looking in your assignment? Because it's kind of a weird word. Yeah, frequency, count. Do I care if you use some different word? If you said something like the number of Marines or the number of families or something like that, do I care if you kind of use your own word over there? No, but you're going to see frequency because it's a generic word that works in every situation. So just make sure that speaks to you. So then, of course, I'm just going to go down here and physically make that graph. Is this uh, is this graph is this graph good? Would it would it go in a magazine, so to speak? Like, could you publish this? Has it got everything you need so that somebody would understand it? And the answer to that is always kind of yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it has a title. It has a label down here. Notice, you, notice there wasn't any need. It was like number of siblings. There wasn't any need to put units like people or something like that. It's kind of obvious. Frequency over there. I mean, it might be given that this was siblings in a Marine platoon, you could argue that maybe that title could have been more descriptive. Like they should have put that in there and so forth. That's not something I'm going to split hairs on. But the main thing that I just want you to walk away with is if you're, if you're going to make a graph, you got to have something written in those three places, even if it's not as good as it could be. And then the graph from there. Okay. But that's pretty uncommon, you know, that you would sort of be lucky in the answer. And when you ask your question of the world, there's only six different answers. Now think about there are examples of this. What if you, what if you made a, a chart like this just playfully by rolling dice. Maybe you like Las Vegas and you want to play craps. And so you want to figure out how dice work. If you roll a dice, there's only six answers, right? So again, that would be like this. Um, 
Um, I'll get to this later, but but if I did roll dice and therefore my answers down here were one, two, three, four, five, six, what do you think the shape of that would look like? Again, I'm saying sort of long term if you rolled the dice many, 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 many times. Or what if you played a different game where you actually didn't record just one dice being rolled, but what if you rolled two dice and it was a sum? And by the way, craps and many games are played with two dice. So you roll the two dice, but all you actually write down is the sum of the two dice. And like a six and a one then would be the same exact answer as a four and a three, because you got seven either way. So, you know, what would be the shape of that distribution? What would it look like? Would there be just as many uh, sums of four as there are sums of 11? Would there be just as many sevens as there are eights? Those kinds of things. Um, so the, the shape is, is kind of an interesting thing. So we'll come back to that shape business in a little bit. But what I want to do now is let's pick one of those two sheets. Let's do the, do the break on the strength one first. Because it's got a few questions to answer. Yeah, come on up here. There's a couple of sheets up there for you. Now, so let's think of this. And notice I said we're sort of practicing to be able to make a bar graph. Notice I told you here there's actually 320 numbers here. But of course, that'd be overwhelming to put on a sheet. So all I really did, can you tell what I did here? I started and they're in order. I listed the smallest one, 130.2, and then it got bigger, bigger, bigger. And then there's gazillions of numbers that are skipped. And then here's like the last six or seven. Does that make sense? So I want to give you a second to think about this from yesterday, even if you likely can't do this yet. Could you figure out the important calculation from yesterday, which is the class width in preparation, because notice in this case, unlike the siblings, we've got, well, probably 320 different answers, and it's not going to be helpful to have a bar graph with 324 bars. So what we want to do is, well, make a bar graph. And so notice I'm actually giving you two, two choices here, but find the upper and lower class limits if there are to be four classes, in other words, bars. You decide you're going to make a four bar bar graph. I don't know if that'd be a good decision here because you have a lot of data, but, but if you did do that, the key is come up with the class width. So what do you do for that? Exactly. Highest number minus low. And by the way, that's on your note sheet that I'll give you for this. Uh, First test, I don't know if I said that yesterday, but but I take the largest number, 244.8, the smallest number, 130.2. I subtract those because that tells me the range. In other words, how how what's the different range of pounds that they break at? And then I divide by the number of classes. 244.8 minus 130.2. So when I subtracted those, I got 114.6. That's probably what you got too. So what that means is, do you understand why that's called the range? Because it's kind of like, I mean, if you're all driving cars and we say, okay, what's the range of different gas mileages your cars get? Will there be maybe a, a range of say 30 miles per gallon between the highest, the best car and the worst car, so to speak? It's, it's basically how much room, how much variation is there. So basically what this is saying is these boards broke at a range of roughly 114 pounds. Some of them broke 114 pounds more than other ones. There's quite a bit of variation as there would be because they're made out of wood, trees, they all grow differently. So when I divided that by four, I got, and notice I said equals 28.65. Is that what you got? I said equals because that did, that was not a decimal that went on forever. It actually stopped. So I didn't have to say approximately equal. Now, 
This is a little different than yesterday, though, because yesterday our data was kind of arguably discrete. At least it was written down as whole numbers. But notice today the data is not whole numbers. It's decimals. It's rounded out to one decimal place. Whoever was collecting this data thought that was important. They decided to round it to one decimal place. What did we say yesterday we had to do to this number? Yeah, we got to round it up. But yesterday we rounded it to the nearest whole number up because the data was a whole number. But notice this time our data is one decimal place. So we got to round this up as well, but round it up to match the data. What would that be? Always up, not round off. Even if that had been 28.61, we're still rounding it up. Good question. Neither. No, you're right. The second one was right. The second one was right, sorry. Um, because I need it to be to match the data. In this case, i.e. one decimal. So this five is going to round that six up to a seven. So my class width is actually 28.7. So round up does not always mean round up to the nearest whole number. It means round it up to whatever the next decimal is. Now, by doing that math, what I want you to watch is First of all, that should seem like a rather mysterious formula. Like, you know, what is what, what are you doing? Why is why does this work? But the key is to get the classes to actually be really close to the data, but include all of it. In other words, I need the classes to pick up the lowest number, 130.2, and also to pick up the highest number, 244.8. Watch how this number helps me do that. So my classes. So if I was kind of making our making our count, just like we did a second ago, we're going to make our count. Here, x is x is the weight in pounds that each one of these things broke at. And so my first class starts at one thirty point two. And it goes, well, I don't know how far yet. But the key is, what do you do with the class width? As this is what we did yesterday, that's where I take the 28.7. So if I take on my calculator 130.2, 130.2 plus 28.7, I get 158.9. And then I do it again, plus 28.7. Of course, it's very easy to hit a button wrong in your calculator and do something kind of stupid. Even though you know what you're doing, you just accidentally hit a button wrong. And that could happen to me just as likely as to you. So tell me if you disagree with me, and we'll figure out which one of us blew it. Plus 28.7, 216.3. To Notice I kind of have no idea if this is working. I'm just kind of using that number that we calculated using that cool formula. But again, I want to highlight what's the logic of this? We figured out that this right here had a, a range. When we subtracted those, we got 116, right? We got around 116. And then we said by dividing by four, we basically said we're going to step our way from 130 up to 244 and how many steps do we want to take we're going to take four steps that's why we divided by four to see how much each step should be and so that's what i'm doing over here i'm stepping up 28.7 i'm stepping up 28.7 i'm stepping up 28.7 now what are those called again What's the bottom end called? The lower. As I mentioned yesterday, I don't 
I don't really care about this. I'm not going to ask you definition type questions. I just want you to be able to read the problems. I want you to be able to read the book a little bit. There'll be questions where they refer. I mean, so what, what else are you going to call it? The bottom numbers, the first numbers. I mean, what are you going to, you got to come up with some name if you want someone to understand it. Now, how do you get the, well, the upper class limit? How do I get the upper class limit from this? These second numbers, how do I get those? Well, again, notice our data was one decimal place here. So I just have to stop short of 158.9, one place, 158.8. That makes sense? Because my data is one decimal place, this makes sure that there's no numbers that fall in the crack. And so then I look at the 187.6 and I say, well, then this must end at 187.5. Five. And I look at 216.3, and I think this must end at 216.2. I remember how we said, you know, for this one, I don't know what to put here because I don't have kind of the next number down there. That was a little kind of a kind of a pain. But remember, the class widths work on both sides. In other words, over here, it's also plus the class width. So in my case down here, I'm just to get that number, I'm gonna say plus the class width plus 28.7. That's how I'm gonna get that other number. So 216.2 plus 28.7, I got 244.9. The key is, do you agree there was actually, there was absolutely no thinking here as soon as you came up with this number. Once we got 28.7, we just mechanically added all those numbers together. I didn't have any other choices after that. I just did what was next on the list to do. But the question is, did it work? Did that little trick we used work? Isn't that cool that the last number was 244.8? And look at the answer. Look at where this ended, 244.9. Like it barely was big enough. Does it make sense? That's, by the way, why we had to round up. If you round, if you round it off, so if this had been, I'm going to erase this, but if this had been 28.62, 20, if I just said round it, then you might have said, oh, that's 28.6. If you would have stepped 28.6 is up there, you wouldn't have made it past our largest number, 244.8. It wouldn't have made it past that. Like, like our, our, uh, the last upper class limit has got to be bigger than 244.8 or there's no, we don't know where to put that number. Does that make sense? So you have to round it up, even in this case, even if that had been 28.62, we still would be rounding it up. It still would have been this. My point is, do you see that it works? That's why you round up. In other words, you gotta take, if you're gonna get there and you wanna at least make sure to make it to the other side, you gotta take a big enough step. And so if you round it down, your steps are gonna be too small. You have to round it up no matter what, and then it'll work. So my point is kind of the proof is in the pudding, like, hey, it worked. So what's important about that, those four classes right there? Well, what's important is they're all exactly the same size. Remember, it would be very, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a very big mistake. Given that people are not going to look at all this stuff, they're just going to look at the picture, right? They're going to look at the bar graph of the siblings and go, look at that. Everybody's crowded over in the zeros, ones, and twos, and that's all they're going to look at. And that's all they should have to look at because you did your job and made sure these classes were all the same. But if you got to this last one, and let's say I'll erase this, but let's say this last one, you did all your math and this last one said 244.2. And you were like, all right, good, I'm done. When you look over here and you realize, uh-oh, these last two numbers over here don't fit, what do you do? You start over. <laughs> like you can't just make the last class bigger. Does that make sense to include it? That'd be easier to do. 
but it means you got your class width wrong. It means you rounded it down or you did your math wrong somehow. That's why it's so cool to use this formula because I don't have to just guess and check to get this to work. If I use this little formula, it just works every time and I'm just done. That's kind of cool. Now, I didn't want you to continue and make a bar graph, which is why I left all these numbers out. Does it make sense? That's the hard part. Now you can actually, you know, go start counting. Now that you have your list, you can say, okay, how many numbers do I have in each one of those classes? And, you know, maybe I have seven of them in this one and 19 of them in that one and 12 in this one and nine in that one or something like that. You go count them all up. But we just, I didn't want you to do that here. We'll do that shortly. Now, do you agree that four classes here in the real world is, is up to you. That's like your choice. How many bars do you want? I want four, good. As I mentioned out loud yesterday, it's somewhere between four and eight is kind of typical. In this case, because the data has 320 numbers to it, four is, is not very many bars. And keep in mind, one of the things that's really powerful about this is what I mentioned on the last one, which is the concept of shape. And if you only have four bars, it's gonna be kind of hard to determine shape. You don't have that many. So basically if you can get six or seven bars, that's kind of ideal, but you can't, you, you can't do six or seven bars if you don't have very much data. Now at the start of this class, I had you guys tell me what your pulse was, but because this class only has like 13 people in it, does it make sense? It's really hard to make a bar graph with only 13 pieces of data. Because if I made like six, six bars, then there'll be like two people in each one of them. And so that isn't all that great of, that isn't all that descriptive, that, that bar graph isn't going to tell us that much because our data size is too small. But we'd like to have six or seven bars somewhere in there so that we can actually determine some shape. So what if you redid this problem? And I'm going to give you time to entirely try to do this yourself and either get it right or screw it up. What if you redid this problem, but you said, ah, oh, four bars is not enough. Let's redo it, but do it with seven classes. Keisha. Uh, two questions. Like, if you know what the number of things is like easier to think of a bar of something, like, you know, 15 bars, is it like best to find evenly dividing here as the bar graph, or is that, is that not happening? Like, You're saying like for 320 up here? Yeah, like, let's say, like, I know that eight divided by yeah. that, so, like, I would get a nice even number of things in each. You won't, it won't matter. And that's only because when you actually look at all the data, you're not going to get the same number in each one. They'll like be scattered all over the place. And so it actually won't save you any trouble to do that. If we get asked about like class width in one of the formulas, it's not asking about the what we rounded up. It's gonna it's gonna be asking about what the like that's a good question. Because in this one, like, okay, I got 16, I can write over, I got 16.27 for the class width, but then technically my class width is about the round up. And like, yeah. In other words, like, if the if a homework assignment asked you what's the class width, would you say 28.65? No. Or would you say 28.7? Because they're both kind of true. But it would even still be like the class width wouldn't be kind of just. In a, in a sense, the class width doesn't really show up until over here. Right. And it's and it's actually this number. Whoops, that was a mistake. Exactly. It's it's whatever's between these two numbers right here, or these two for that matter, or for that matter, these so, two. So but that's okay. So that's the class width would be the 28.7. So yeah. the 28.7 class width. Yeah. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's 28.7. Yeah. As well as the like what we add. That's exactly right. Okay. And that's why they gave it a name, because you can see that's a pretty important number. Right. So, you know, mathematicians are sort of famous for like just good names and stuff, which turns classes like this into, and I hate that part of math that turns it into a, like a reading class or something like that. But you, so this class is, is even worse than most classes in that regard. There's a little bit of terminology, but the important thing there is to have the concept behind it, not so much the exact wording. Although that, if you don't have the wording, it's going to make you miss some problems. And so there's like a balance there. But my tests are not going to have, like if you if you were taking a test and you came up and you asked that exact question of me during the test, you're like, oh, you asked about class with here. Is that, it, I've got two things. I'm thinking it could be either one of these. I'm thinking it, it's this one. Is that right? I'd probably answer that question for you, even though it was a test, because I really am not super concerned about that. That's the kind of thing you could look up. If you're going to miss something, I want you to miss the concept, not 
Oh, you memorized the word wrong. You said class size and it's class width minus two. Like I'm not. Yeah, it's like not to do exactly what I want. Like oh, well, yeah, yeah. And to that end, that's why I want to have some time in class for you to actually ask me those kinds of questions specifically on my open math, because what I don't want this class to turn into as far as what I teach you is all of these nitpicky little definitions. I want you to think in here. And then when you have a question on some nitpicky, stupid, my open math question, just ask me and I'll come over and say, oh, this is what they mean and then move on. So can you create the classes? The important thing is to be able to create this, this class over here, this set of four classes so that you can then make your count. And we're gonna do that in a second on the second piece of paper, we're actually gonna make it. But can you create the classes for, for seven? I'm gonna give you enough time to, to either get it entirely right or entirely wrong. And I, I haven't done this yet, so you can't ask me, is this right?
So did you notice you did not get, you still got a decimal, but this one went on forever. So again, I'm rounding up, but to one decimal place. So I wish one of these examples would have come up. I mentioned this on the last problem, but instead of like 16.37, you're going to round that up to 16.4, just because that's how rounding works. But even if that had been 16.302, you still would call that 16.4. Cause there's numbers over here and automatically that's got to rent, that's got to cause that to round up. I'm gonna do this on the, the board just to show you, but, but watch what happens. Like, let's say I thought it was 16.3. So I'm going to add 16.3 and I don't know it, but I've, I've blown it because I rounded well down. And as I said, if this had been 16.31, some of you might have called it 16.3 because you're thinking of it as being rounded off, not rounded up. It's always rounded up. So if you thought 16.3, so I'm just going to, I'm going to do part of this table, but not all of it. So this should not be what you have on your sheet. That's why I'm not writing it up on the board. One, two, two, three, four, six. So I won't bother to fill all these numbers in, but if I if I got to this last one, this is where this ends. That's what happens if you round down. Now, why does that not work? Can you check your own work? Like, don't just turn this in. Like, why didn't that work? Yeah. Notice how it missed the last two numbers. That's what happens if you round it down. Your steps aren't big enough. You don't quite make it to the other side. Now you're really close. You rounded it off, but you got to round up if you want to if you want to include those. Now you're never going to land right on 244.8 or very rarely. But if you round up, you'll at least go past it. If you round down, you're going to fall short. I just wanted you to see that once so that you understand why it's important to actually round up. 16.3 is pretty darn close, but it, see how it doesn't work. So did you notice yours went, I hope, just a hair past 244.8? I'll quickly do this correctly. While I'm at it, I'm just going to do the lower one at the same time. The other thing I want to say just while I'm thinking about it is you're pushing a lot of buttons here. Like even, even with a small class like this, somebody pushed a button wrong. Does that make sense? And, and it, it's just as likely to be me as it is you. You should understand just because I'm the teacher doesn't mean I'm, I'm not going to make dumb mistakes. And I hope to make a number of them in front of you because you need that needs to put you at ease. And so you, what I hope is that you don't make that dumb mistake on the test. But, but if I see... If I see a bunch of things that are correct here and then one number is suddenly off, then I'll know that's kind of what happened. I can still tell you know what you're talking about and hopefully not take any points off. I'm very, on a test I grade extremely thoroughly in the sense that I'm looking for signs of intelligence. I don't, do, I don't just look at it and go, oh, yours doesn't match mine, you know, minus 10. I look to see, did you actually calculate and does this calculation show somewhere over there? You don't need to write any of that down to do it, but at least if you write some of it down, I can totally tell you know what you're talking about. 
And then like me, if you make the first few steps here and everything is fine, like you haven't made any mistakes and then suddenly a mistake happens, then I can tell it's just a button pushing mistake. And if point crescent's worth 10 points, the very most I'm gonna take off is one and I might not even take off any. So make sure you kind of think in terms of the fact that, hey, somebody's looking at this. And having said that, I hope I'm, I hope I make one of those mistakes right now. That'd be perfect timing. Let's see, I'm up to five classes. For me personally, if it's really important, what I just did is I went, I went fairly fast there. I make a lot of mistakes personally because I go too fast, but I usually stop to, to catch them. Like I might stop and look back at all the stuff I typed in my calculator. Or as I said, one of the things I'm gonna check is, oh, I ended at 244.9. Oh good, look, that went a little past 244.8. But I could have made a dumb mistake right there. So. Yeah, the 53.9 up to the 53.163.9. Do you, do you matter if you put the nine there or not? Because if you do right, it's kind of like a pain. Say that, say that one more time. I didn't understand. So the upper class, the, the, the second line, um, upper class 163.9. Yeah. And then it jumps to 153. Yep. Do you have to put the nine there? Because either way, if it's there or not there, it's all the other numbers are the same. So. You're saying, could I just do that? Yeah. The answer is, well, yes, unless you go over to the data and we don't have all the data, but notice the data is rounded to one decimal place. So is it possible that I went over to the data and there was a 162.4? But not all of them are rounded to the decimal place. Though. Well, it, it, the key is it really is. In other words, this is really 163.0. It's just I didn't bother to put the zero in there. Okay. So all these numbers are rounded to the the tenth, and the problem is the data is rounded to the tenth, and so I got to have this accurate to the tenth. So when I saw that that was one sixty three, I just said, "Oh, I have to go point one minus that," mm -hmm. and now this number would would belong somewhere. If that was one of my boards that I broke, I would know that it belongs in this class. Whereas if that was one sixty two, I wouldn't know which one. It's between. Oh, okay. It falls between the cracks. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful question. So if you didn't get what I got, is it? do you understand why? Like, please be proactive. This is something you're gonna do a lot in this class. You're gonna, you're still gonna be doing this at the end of this class, one of your final projects when you make a bar graph and we'll be doing it for a week or so here. So it's just not something you wanna be doing wrong. If you made a dumb mistake, fine. Okay, oops, but I, I'm, I, I apparently didn't make a dumb mistake because usually when I do, when I when I talk like this, if suddenly three hands go up, I before <laughs> I always kind of know up. Oh, I, I did something dumb because they're all about to tell me what I got wrong. Okay. So I want you now to try this for real. Um, in the sense that I actually gave you the data here. And this is kind of what's going to happen in Excel. And we'll be doing this in Excel on Monday. But notice over here, I said raw data. And again, this was actually somebody's project. Um, I'm always kind of stealing data that students thought were interesting. But gas prices, you know, anything, any data that pertains to a state is, is pretty easy to find on the internet. And, and by the way, Make, make a note of this, but Monday, you're gonna be doing this exactly what we're doing right now, except you're gonna just be doing your own data. Like I want you to go find some on the internet. Um, and one of the easy places to search, I'll just give you a couple of simple ideas. Cause I really, what I don't want Monday is for you to sit there surfing online, looking for data for 40 minutes. Like I want you to be doing math. So 
There's two places that I find fairly easy. One of them is searching by state because you get a decent amount of numbers and it's usually kind of easy to find. So you can do like population by state or gas prices or something like that. And the other one that's really easy that might be interesting to you, and this is the illustration I'll use tomorrow is some kind of a sports illustration. Like if you go find a pro football team and you, and you look for the roster of the pro football team, they'll be like the player heights or the player's age or the player's weight or something like that. And usually those pro rosters are like 120, 140 people. And so that's like, it's super easy to find. And you can find it in 10 seconds and then get on with the math. But I'm telling you now, because if you want your data to be interesting to you, you might want to surf that up before Monday. Um, if, if you're you know willing to waste some of your time, and I would consider that a waste of time, honestly. Um, so go find something interesting to you. Um, so here's gas prices. Well, can you appreciate when I found them on the internet, they were out of order. Notice they were, I said raw, just because they're all out of order. So $4.07, $3.54, $3.59, $3.68, they're all out of order. But then I went in and sorted them. And I did that for your sake, because it's going to be very easy for you to actually make the bar graph. So I actually want you to draw the bar graph. Now, let me say something before you turn, before I turn you loose here. Notice I didn't say bar graph here. I said histogram. You'll see that in your assignment. That's another one of those. I wish that word didn't exist when people are just learning this. A bar graph looks like this. But some, I'll say idiot, decided that if the bars look like this, and they're touching, that if there's no gaps between them, they decided that needed a different name. I'm just gonna, I'm never gonna say the word histogram. The only reason I even put it in here is because I saw it show up in your assignment. But they're just bar graphs. Who cares whether the bars touch or not? It doesn't really make that much difference. But I actually want you to make a rough drawing of this and try to do a decent job. Like you're gonna sketch it and it's gonna look terrible anyway, but try to do a decent job of sketching it. But I just wanna, you loose to do that. And this is the kind of thing I would ask on a test. I don't know if I would ask you to actually draw the graph. Maybe I would, but I will tell you how many bars to use just because it's going to take me forever to grade it if I let you pick your own bars because then I'll have to do the same problem like six times or whatever. Say again? Yeah, so this time, because I gave you the data, you're actually going to count them up. Like how many, how many are in each class? So you're going to get your... Where was we? You're going to get these classes just like you did last time. But now, because you actually have the data sitting in front of you, you can actually go count up how many of them are in each class. And so, yeah, you're going to write down the frequency. So make the entire table. that has X with your classes. And I want your bar graph to be, you know, really rough, but this time you're gonna be able to count them because the data's in front of you. So you're doing the whole thing now, you're, you're, you're flying. Five, that's on there, five bar, five bars. So your variable, the thing that you asked in this question is, what's the price of gas? Notice that these numbers are even rounded different as well. Like these are rounded to two decimal places. So think about that.
Let me say a couple of things really quick. I know you're still in the middle of it, but just to make sure you got through the first part portion and more importantly, that you actually understand it. Do you understand when you take the biggest number minus the smallest number, you're getting what you might see in your assignment is called the range, 91 cents. But, but this is a good place to understand why that's called the range because does it make sense there's 91 cents between the cheapest gas and the most expensive gas? That's why it's called the range. So that kind of makes sense. And so basically, I got a I got a, a range of 91 cents. I've got to cover in my classes, and then I've decided to step from the bottom one to the top one in five steps. And so that's why I'm dividing by five. And so I got 18 cents, 18.2 cents. And my first thought was like, whoa, why is that number so small? And then I stopped and thought, oh yeah, I guess it makes sense. It'd be pennies between each one. But again, look at your data this time. Your data is rounded to two places, so therefore your Class width also needs to be rounded in two places. But again, this is a really good example because this two here has got to cause that eight to round up, not off. Round it off, this would be 18 cents. But if you step 18 cents, you actually won't get high enough. You've got to round that up. And so this is your class width, 19 cents. And you'll notice that just works if you use that. Thank you. 
Now. Given that the highest dollar amount was 442, notice it went just a little past that 445. Perfect. The best you can do, you can't get it to land right on 442. Notice because you're this time your data is two decimal places, that means all the classes, the upper class limits and the lower class limits, also need to be two decimal places. Shaft just asked me a good question that I'll highlight here that I said something about a second ago, but she had 3.6 right there. And she's like, do I need that nine? And the question I asked her was, what are you gonna do with 362? If this goes from 351 to 360, and this goes from 370 to 388, does it make sense 3.62 doesn't belong in either one of those classes? So because your data is two decimal places, you really need all of these lower and upper class limits to be due decimal places. Does it make sense? There's still, there are still numbers between 3.69 and 3.7, like 3.695. If there were any prices over here of gas that were 3.695, then I wouldn't know where to put them, but they're two decimal places. And so there's nothing that can slip into the cracks, if that makes sense. Um, out of laziness, notice I called it 3.7, but you know, just to make Sure, there's nothing wrong with three dollars and seventy. And because they're in order now, they're actually not that hard to count. Do you agree with that? Let's see. Three sixty-nine. So there's my first. There's my first ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 13, I got 13 of those. And then up to 388. You might notice you had some that were right on 388 and some that are right on 389. So it's like, that's why even one penny here makes a lot of difference in terms of where each of those gas prices goes. So there's a lot of them in this class. I don't think I can even count that high. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Got 24. Hope I didn't count that wrong. On a test, is it a big deal if you count one of those wrong? Not really, but those little circles help because then I could just I could look and see, you know, oh yeah, you circled the right ones, but you just counted wrong. That'd be easy to do. Again, I'm not sure I didn't count wrong. So, one good thing you could do to check those. Notice up here at the top, I told you n is 51. There's actually 51 prices there. So what could I do to check my work? Yeah, take these right here and add them all up and make sure they add to 51. Because if I counted one twice or I missed one, then that wouldn't add to 51. And then maybe at least I'd be a clue. Oh, 
However, even being, if you were one off, is that really gonna change the overall shape of this graph? It's really not. So, it's, I mean, it's not that big a deal. It'd be, it'd be a big deal if you were off by a lot, but. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Puerto Rico, I guess. So, and it afterwards, if you will, it's kind of not surprising that there weren't very many of the high ones because that's probably like California because they charge too much for everything. And then, you know, Hawaii or something, you got to take it over there on a ship or something. So it costs more. It makes sense. And I got around everybody and kind of, you know, chatted with you a little bit one on one, which is really important. Um, please. Please advocate for yourself in this class. You know, like I had time there to walk around, but for at least half of you, I answered what was a really important question for you. And if I didn't come around, would you have would you have done anything about that? Like, would you have come up and asked, "Does this work?" Like, bug me. Like, that's what I'm getting paid for. Don't just sit there. This stuff is not hard. You can do this. It takes a little bit of practice. But in a class like this, it, especially if it's even bigger than this, when the teacher says something, you just kind of look around and think, oh, everybody else is getting it but me. I answered at, at least a question for two thirds of you in this class when I went around. You had a question for me. It's like, you, you, hearing me say this once is not equal to understanding it. So advocate for yourself. Come to my office hours, stay after class, bug me. Like, figure this out. You can do this. As I said, you will pass this class if you do that. If you sit there and just kind of let it wash over you and you think, oh, I'm dumb, I don't understand this. I've taught for a long time. I can explain this to you. And I don't care if we need to talk about it two times, three times, four times. This is no fun for me if you don't understand this. I'm not happy just leaving going, oh, I taught well. If you don't get it, I have accomplished nothing. Like, this isn't fun for me either. Um, now, the cool thing, and I, I showed you this quickly in Excel, the cool thing in Excel is I can actually just grab that and say, make me a graph, and it'll look awesome and almost be finished. That's what's really cool. But it is kind of cool to have to at least think about the logic behind it. I mean, you do appreciate someone's probably sitting there making lots of money today because they made Excel, right? They aren't working today. They're making a gazillion dollars. So they, they must have understood this and really understood it. So it's kind of cool just to understand the logic behind it. But if you were to make a rough sketch of this, as I said, if you really wanted to do it right, you'd probably have to do it twice. Because the first time it's probably going to look a little janky, but who cares? So what am I going to see? Well, I'm going to make, I am going to make a histogram and make five bars. So I'm trying to estimate five bars here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that works. So there's all my bars. Notice I don't have room to write 351-3.69 unless I kind of turn this program sideways a little bit. I probably am not going to write all of this out, just some of it. And this is something you can actually do in Excel too. There's all kinds of tricks. You can turn things sideways and we could nerd out. And, and so that's cool. And then over here, I've got frequency. And notice I need to make it to 24. And so I drew a line there with no particular plan in mind. But what I probably don't want to do is go one, two, three, four, five, six, because at some point I'm going to realize, uh-oh, 21, 24 is like clear up there off the screen, right? So here's kind of a just kind of a cool way of thinking. If I say, okay, well, I want it to be this tall, then I'll call that 24. And I don't know, maybe I'll split that in half and call that 12 and I'll split that in half and call that six. And so this would be 18 and, and maybe, you know, is that, is it looking crowded at some point it looks too crowded, right? Should I keep going? Should I split it in half even one more time? I'm going to try and see if that's a good idea. 15, three more is 21. See, at least that's, I mean, it's a sketch, but at least that looks decent, but I can't really afford to write every single number. now I've got everything I need to kind of get after it. So 13 for the first one, I guess that'd be about right there. And 24 for that next one is all the way up to there. And then 10 for the next one is also, it's kind of hard to 
if it's a sketch, it's kind of hard to get it exactly right. And then three, and then one. That's not bad for a sketch, right? Does the job. Given how this is labeled, and you can do this in Excel as well, but given how this is labeled, it's not, lab it's not labeled super good. It's not sitting on a piece of graph paper where you can actually see very clearly. Does it make sense if you're staring at this one? You, it's hard to identify if that's a three for sure. If it was on graph paper, maybe I could. But it's kind of cool. Why does that keep happening? No idea. But it's kind of cool to, you know, if, if you're worried about that, you can always come back and label it, like put a 24 up there and put a 13 here and put a 10 there and a three here and a one there. I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. Now we were just worried about the math, but what's missing from this graph besides the rest of these labels? What else is missing? Yeah, title. Um, U.S. gas prices. I'm kind of lazy. I'm going to shoot, choose the smallest title I possibly can so I can go do something else. U.S. gas prices. Probably that'd be good to have a year on there, right? That's not permanent. So 2021 or something like that. Down here, it would probably be good to say like price per gallon. It's sort of like a duh in our country, but even saying the units are dollars, price per gallon in dollars. And I already put frequency on the other side. So now it's a good graph. Now it's actually, now it speaks, especially if I had 2021 here or something like that. Even as a sketch, that's pretty cool. Do you see that we know something now about gas prices that we didn't know before? And so if you look at your own state now, you would have a way of saying like, you know, you know what our gas prices are, aren't they? Like four bucks now. So it's kind of like we're we're here. Kind of helps you see. It's like wow, there's a lot of states that have cheaper gas than we do. We now know that. We can say that now, and we couldn't say that a minute ago. So I want to say something about shape now, and then we'll we'll be done. So you go to all this trouble to make this, and the whole point is like, bam. I mean, it took, it took us 20 minutes to do this, but this is really kind of cool now because somebody could just stare at that and immediately kind of know what's going on. And keep in mind, this is a little bit more practical than the sibling thing because because if you were going to sort of start a gas station, this would tell you something about you know where you should be. Or if you were the if your state was over here, maybe as a politician, you'd kind of say, hey, you know, we got to get back in line here. We're we're way out in the in the tail. This graph definitely has kind of a tail in it. And so there's not too many people out in that tail. And so this is a little bit weird, but this graph is skewed actually right. That's the shape of this graph. Now you might say, you might think as you, as you probably would, isn't that skewed left? Like everybody's crowded to the left, isn't that skewed left? And the answer to that is the reason mathematicians say it's skewed right is do you understand that this, this gas right here is what caused that to happen? It's like if these, if these kind of, these few sort of high priced gases weren't here, then that wouldn't have happened. So having one really high price, and it's, just, it's actually especially that last one. Notice the rest of them seem to jump up by three cents, no cents, two cents, one cent, two cents, 27 cents or 25 cents. Like what's going on? Does it, does it make sense that one was like way out there? That's why it's called skewed right. That one is the one that caused it. So that's what made this tail. As I was mentioning earlier, the sibling graph, for instance, if my grandma was on there with 16 siblings, that would have kind of screwed the graph up. Does that make sense? Basically, this is, you know, the graph basically is just saying, yeah, normal people, they're kind of hanging out. Normal states are hanging out in the, you know, in this range based on the graph, right? They're hanging out in here. But then we have this tail to the right. So when you call it, we call it skewed right 
because of the tail. You're paying attention to the tail, not the crowd. And so it's this outline. We'll be talking about this later on, but That's, that's an outlier right there. That's like an outlier state. That's kind of crazy how high that is. It jumps so much higher than all the rest of them. So that's what's making it right. So would you agree that this one was also skewed right? It's kind of the same basic shape. Take a look at this. And then we'll be done. So here's a pre-made graph. This is also stolen from a student last term who was really into the Mets. And they looked at batting averages. And notice this is actually single season batting averages. This is actually the best, the best hitters. Let's see. Yeah, individual players. This is like the best the best hitters that have ever played for the Mets. I don't know if you know anything about baseball, but to have a batting average of 345 is insane. That is really large. There's only one person out there. The majority of people had averages that were down here. And so again, if you can see that one person is kind of what caused that to be skewed, right? So the shape of that, again, isn't that kind of cool? Like you don't even have to see the data to kind of know where the crowd is. Hey, the crowd's on the left in this case. And there's kind of outliers to the right. So this is also skewed right. Is it always skewed right? This is also from somebody's lab last term. They found female heights in various world countries. That's kind of interesting, right? Don't you think of different countries as having different heights? I think of Oriental people as being shorter than Americans and Africans as being taller than Americans and so forth. So isn't that cool? Like, and that's a pretty good looking graph, isn't it? And that's, that's straight from Excel. That's the lab we're gonna be doing on Monday. That's where they did this, but notice they kind of played around with colors. This person had a little artistic flavor because it's all purple, purples and pinks. And so it kind of looks good. Um, it's got a good label on it. Notice they told us not just height, but they said height in centimeters. That's pretty important. They got centimeters in there, isn't it? And let's see, average female heights in various world countries. I say that's a pretty excellent title. I can't think of anything I don't know there from that statement. So look at the shape of that graph. And again, you can easily see just kind of staring at it that obviously most people hang out in here. There's a few people that are really tall, but lots more people that are kind of really short. Would you agree that's a little bit skewed left? Again, the idea is that just tells you something. So if if we said, hmm, I wonder about you know females in our country, I wonder what America is. If you had to guess, you would say, of course, oh, they're probably in here somewhere. But if you were here, then based on this graph, that would kind of tell you something, right? Wow, I'm down there with only two. Now notice, what did they make their graph of? This graph looks like the one you just made, which is a frequency distribution. And by the way, notice they didn't use the word frequency over here. I think that's actually good because nobody understands what that means. They just said it's the number of players. And then in context, that actually makes a lot more sense. Everybody would be able to read that. Whereas if they write frequency, probably they wouldn't be able to read it. So they made a frequency graph, whereas this person did a percentage. And actually, doesn't that percentage actually help? Like it doesn't really matter the number. It's like 2% of countries have uh, average female height this small, 49% have an average, and percent's actually kind of better. That's why we need to be good at it. What we're going to spend a lot of time studying in this class, though, is this one. This was also somebody's project. What about that one, would you say? Yeah, notice it's kind of like right in the middle. It's not skewed at all. Not skewed. I think that was... Hannah that said that, but this is bell shaped. And of course that comes from the fact that, doesn't that kind of look like a bell? That is super common. And we're gonna be spending a lot of time with that idea as this term progresses because there's lots of things that are like that. In other words, 
you know, if you just ask somebody, how many miles of how many miles do you drive each month? That some people pay attention to in their cars because it affects their value. Does it make sense there'd be a whole crowd of people in the middle someplace, and there'd be occasionally the salesman that's way out there and 100,000 miles a year, and then there'd be somebody that only drives to town once a month, and so there'd be very few people in detail, and then everybody'd be crowded somewhere in the middle. Does it make sense? That's a, a really kind of a common shape. So it turns out there's a lot, a lot you can do with that shape. So something being bell shaped is is important. There's a bunch of things we can know about it later on. Um, notice this graph had the labels on it. Does it make sense? 17 would have been hard to determine exactly. And by the way, now that I'm staring at this, what's wrong with this graph? I didn't notice that till just now. Notice how it like doesn't match. It's like I was expecting when I saw 17, I was expecting to look over here. Yeah. So let's stare at this for just a second longer. Notice proportionally it looks okay. Like this is 49% and this is like half as tall. So I think the shape is still okay. But it's kind of like this person had frequencies on the side, but then their graph must have been looking at the percents or something like that. So I didn't even notice that. The graph is actually still okay, but notice it's really good thing that they labeled it because otherwise you would have looked over here and said that was like eight or nine, wouldn't you? So that's kind of screwed up, isn't it? And I'm glad that happened. So this, as nice as it looked, they actually kind of screwed it up a little bit. And then also notice they said frequency not not a nicer word what about this one is this graph okay it's got everything nothing wrong with it what's a little problematic about weights here though yeah is this pounds or kilograms i don't i don't know that that'd be good to have on there wouldn't it now now again, in a sense, does it matter? I mean, I can, if I'm looking at the shape, I can see that it's bell-shaped and that's still worth something, but it would have been good for them to include the unit there, wouldn't it? And then players, I think this makes sense. And, and notice theirs is also not a frequency distribution. And, and make sure that word means something to you, frequency distribution, because that's the kind of thing that in an assignment is going to make you feel like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what's going on. But frequency was just the count, right? That's what we did on the previous page when we counted up 24 and 10 and three. We just counted up how many there were. But then the distribution of that is just, well, what are the different weights? What are the different weights of these players? They're distributed all over the place. Lots of people in the middle, not very many big, not very many small. So maybe it would have been you know, good to say number of players or something like that, but I think we all know what they mean. And then I like that they did a percentage, although does it make sense? I can't really tell what this one is. So that's why it's kind of cool to put the label on top. But you also might think, no, nah, that's distracting. They don't need to see those numbers. They can see the shape. That's good enough. That's arguable. Um, if I remember right, because I think this was last term, I actually think this was off one team, if that's true then you know, saying what team it was and what year that was, because it's not going to be the same from year to year. This leads me to believe that this is the, like all soccer players in the universe, because it says soccer player weights. So that left a little bit on the table. As far as me grading this, you put a title there, I don't really care. I'm not going to look at it, but that's worth thinking about. Keep in mind, if you want to make money at this or you know, get a raise at your work, being able to do a good job with these things so that people don't left with questions or you know you didn't even you didn't make a mistake that's kind of good to not screw that up if i was to roll dice i'm rolling a dice the the variable is you get one two three four five or a six how would that be distributed if I went roll, 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 and just kind of recorded what happened, recorded what happened, recorded what happened? What do you think the shape of that graph would be? Pretty flat. Yeah, pretty flat. Because there's no reason, there's not more people in the middle of the weights. There's not more threes and fours. It's just the same chance of rolling a one as it is rolling a six. 
And so you probably would get something that looked more like this. Something like that. Now, if you kept going forever, it would actually be almost flat because there is exactly the same chance for something that happens. But notice this doesn't have kind of that crowd. There's no crowd here. I forgot what this is called, uniform. It was in my mind and suddenly just went away. Uniform shape. Dang it. So the whole point of this is, that, is to recognize kind of the different shapes that you get and so forth. Um, if it's skewed left, you know, that kind of indicates there, as I said before, there might be an outlier here. If it's skewed right, I'm sorry, this was skewed right. If it's skewed right, there might be an outlier there. This one's skewed left, there might be an outlier. That might be kind of an outlier country, if you will, or a couple of countries that are down there. But that's one of the purposes of making a bar graph. So it's actually kind of a lot to it. I mean, you probably are a person that took that for granted when you saw it in a magazine, but it's like, this takes a little bit of thought. It takes a little bit of time to do a good job with this. Okay, I'm shutting up. And what I would recommend you do